all right we're back and uh this this may mark the end of this i'm not sure i don't I, but uh it's golgotha which is usually how most runs end i think i've seen a lot of people say like <laughs> i mean uh not, not, not like discounting a lot of uh like negative reviews in, in steam i have seen just a few it's like golgotha sucks <laughs> Golgotha was the is the is is I think the moment in our design trajectory where we sort of stopped cargo culting existing roguelikes and and sat down and built something that was uniquely cud and it's the first moment when Caves of Cud really says we're we're doing something that's not room and hall dungeon crawling you're 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 in for a little bit of an adventure here um it's it's probably for a while it was too deep in the game i think red rock does a better job of selling caves of cut nowadays um than it did in the early days uh for a while people would play and play red rock and go like i don't see what anyone sees in this game because it's just like every other roguelike except there's hyena guys instead of goblins right <laughs> right um whereas golgoth is a different thing altogether Golgotha is a is a weird conveyor belt, trash ridden, trap infested, disease ridden <laughs> eel eel feel filled hellhole, and it's not very long. It's not a thirty level dungeon, right? Just a few levels, which are hyper dense and very deadly. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> And you really, you really just can't, you can't spend any time in there. You, you, you got to book it down those conveyor belts because you are in danger. And every, every turn you spend on those conveyor belts is, is danger stacking up around you. Is another chance for liquid to end up in front of you and you to fall face first and get a mouthful and then have a very bad time the rest of the game. Or crabs are crawling out of the vents, or more more stuff's catching on fire from the flaming vents, and more creatures are coming down behind you, chasing you down the vents, and so it's just, it's a it's a it's a it's a frantic dungeon in a turn based game, and I think it achieved that goal in in a way that I still really enjoy. So um, I realize I have fatally erred. I didn't make a checkpoint after I got the full right bones. Oh yeah, and uh, the thing is, is that rusted archway well, is still gonna be—it's gonna be regenerated if I go down there, right? Yeah, it is. It's it's theoretically seated, so it should be pretty similar. But the seating is still a little unstable, which it's... is something I do want to clean up before release. But the oh, the really? of succeeding is 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 very very hard, and is it, it it falls apart to entropy very quickly, and so I want to do that sort of late in the development cycle so that it's. We've got a lot of the major changes done before I go in there and really tighten up the deterministic seating. I find it interesting that you want to change it because I actually I think it kind of adds something to role play mode. Yeah, like it's that you you win some and lose some, right? Like dailies become pretty meaningless um, <clears throat> in a in a in, in a world where everyone's daily is different, right? Right. Um, in roleplay mode, yeah, there's an argument that you want some some differences and some similarities. How much of that is, I don't know. I think if we do want, I I, I would rather it be designed than completely undesigned uh, behavior, though, uh, which is what it is now. Like the things that are different are different because something's wrong with the ter deterministic seating system, not because we intentionally made it that way that's interesting i mean like and i know um jason did like a whole talk about this basically um in last year's roguelike celebration um which was like when when kind of um bugs become part of the design yeah or like when when that is and i'm i'm like really not sure when when that is and like um, well, I, I don't I don't think anybody is and that's a really fantastic talk um if anybody's interested uh, maybe you can link it in the description of this video but it's a it's a 
I I would really recommend that talk. It's something that we we sort of grew into over Cud, and I can't do it any more justice than just listening to Jason talk about it. I'll definitely throw the link in the description. Um for for that yeah i think it was it was it like i don't know if it had a, an actual title or, but it was like the broken fountain or something like that um uh, yeah it's it's called um before you fix a leak ask if it's a fountain which, right which is which which is the the basis of the idea right to to say not every crack in the edifice of the game ended up being something we should spackle over right? right sometimes and especially when you're working with a game as complicated as cud with systems as complicated as cud we can't predict the full surface area of the impact we do our our best to but when we make a change to these systems there's there's always surprising results and jason's jason's title which is before you fix a leak ask if it's a fountain is asking hey does this improve the garden that this that this thing is happening in that this outcome is happening in is it is it like filling people with wonder and delight when it happens even though we we didn't mean it to happen and so that's something we ask whenever we look at a bug report or a surprising interaction because we're in communication with these complex systems these are systems that are are us for the last 15 years and are, are outside of us are sort of evolving in their own way and we are trying to do our best to like listen to what these systems are saying right sometimes it's just bad sometimes you got to fix it sometimes it's an interesting interaction that causes degenerate player behavior right which is <laughs> one 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 of the things that we we really have to do as, as a game designer yeah. is fight uh, uh, uh the the players urge to optimize and often players will just do miserable things because it's the best way to play the game and so when we fix a bug or an exploit it's often not because we care if the bug or exploit breaks the mechanics of the game we don't really care that unless it's like doing it in a degenerate way what we do care is if it's having the player do something that's like deeply unfun because it's just the best way to play the game and a lot of players will play play and like sort of punish themselves in that way so we try to sort of put rails up where people are falling off the cliff of these system designs and going like i hate being in this hole down here <laughs> right and you could say like just don't go in that hole <laughs> right but Stop there's like some gold hole. down yeah like there's some gold down there so it, you you those are the holes you really want to 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 cover over it's that people like just can't help jumping down into it's just it's it's a it's like it's become a meme here but um it really does it, it is kind of like intrinsically um you know this hole was made for me it, it, no, it, we got, it, we're trying to unmake like that, that, that hole right yeah yeah like like we try to spackle over those that are like making people do things that are not fun right we want people to feel empowered to do interesting things in the game we want people to break the game all of those things are good we don't want you to have to go like kill 150,000 dragonflies in order to get a single dragon wing to get a million free xp or whatever it happens to be because it's just not fun right like we don't want to incentivize those unfun play patterns right yeah i mean um like i i had mixed feelings about this but a pattern i i started to find myself in with cud was like Oh yeah, just like walk to Ezra right away. Yeah. Like get some wayfaring, walk to Ezra right away, and um, you know, see if you can uh, like you can love injector one of the merchants, steal all their stuff, um, like get a get to uh, a, a recoiler, and it's like now you're you're good. You, like you're set up basically for the rest of the game. Yeah. Um, oh, I need this the credits. That, you see that kind of outcome i don't feel too bad about right like if you like that kind of outcome is difficult enough that people and is random enough like there's no certainty there like oftentimes you'll you got a big chance of getting lost no matter what you do right end up in a river and a mad pole will eat you and i think that's like enough of lack of optimal outcome for people to self-filter that kind of behavior and if they get if they get a kick out of doing that, it's it's possible, right? Like we don't want to we don't want to get you from walking to Ezra at level one. 
that's part of what's fun about Caves of Cuddens Open. Right? Like, you can go walk to the spindle if you want to. Go for it, right? Like, you might find a laser cannon, and then you can pick it up, because it's not its not like you have to be level 40 to be a laser cannon. And if you do, great, go to Red Rock with a laser cannon. He's still probably going to die. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's... it's the, that kind of that kind of strategy doesn't feel degenerate to me. That feels like using the open world the way it's supposed to be used. I um I think a great example of what you're talking about, and I mean I've I've kind of touched on this sort of on it various times, but like I think that um and I don't know if you've played this, but I think unfortunate things have happened over the course of like the Binding of Isaac's development, um in that like it's a complex enough game. But there are certain systems that people have figured out that lead to exactly the kind of behavior you're talking about, where it's like every single run, I have to go and like play the slot machine like a hundred times to get yeah. this kind of thing. And uh, and then I have to play the devil, you know, trade like this, exactly this kind of way and get this item. And it leads to very, very unfun, very boring, very tedious, rep re repetitive tasks to yeah. uh, fully optimize the game. Um, I know that uh, yeah, Edmund that's, has that's, talked about. It's a trap. Here. A lot of games, yeah, it's a trap. A lot of games fall into. Um, and it's hard because some people really enjoy that. Like they get a lot of fun out of abusing those things, those systems that most people find unfun. And so when you close those ga those holes up, you rightfully upset the people who enjoyed, you know, like clo like infinite cloning abuse that's made easy by making an infinite amount of cloning juice because our desalinization systems aren't <laughs> aren't complex enough, right? Um, um, like some people really enjoy that, and when you close it up, because people are like, I don't want to have to go to the stilt and clone every merchant a hundred times at the beginning of the game because it's just too easy. I, net net it's better for the game but the people who want to do that are rightfully angry that we we that we stop that particular exploit whatever it happens to be mm -hmm. um, so it's all it's always a bit of a balancing act i don't think there's like an objectively correct way to do it you're always gonna upset somebody for sure i mean uh, uh for instance um i i was kind of upset i couldn't take advantage of the canned have it all bug before it yeah, got yeah. patched out yeah. um but I understand taking it out because it's like then the game becomes the can't have it all game, right? Because then yeah. it's like you, uh, yeah. I mean, if I really want to um, optimize my, my run, I, I I have to seek out can't have it all. It's just it's just you know it would be bad play not to. Yeah, like and you know there's there's plenty of mechanics in the game. You can get an infinite AV if you want, and we don't want to stop you from getting an infinite AV. We want to you to we want to stop you from incentivizing you to have from having to do something like boring and it that is certain to get you an infinite av that's mm -hmm. not that's not that interesting right like there should be some jeopardy or some risk or some interest in in the in the play you're making to get an infinite av um, so that's sort of that's the that's a that's the difference in velocity v from caves of cud and like morrowind and like an mmo that like you cannot get an infinite av because you break the the games as a service design baseline right like you you just cannot um and and that's the upside of making a game like caves of cud that is sort of single player and isolated and a little individual story that we aren't constrained by you not being able to be infinitely powerful we just want to make it an interesting game to get there each time yeah like um i know like sunslag is a fairly recent uh addition um, yeah relatively and uh i i managed to find like a legendary apothecarist or not apothecarist or just like liquid seller merchant um yep. that uh, sold them so it's like yeah clone them a few times and uh now i have like access to tons of brain brine sun slag all all of the good stuff so then like yeah that run became very much like go and seek out lots of things to sell and then yeah buy but that's perfect to me because it requires it requires a systems knowledge a systems mastery and then also encountering a a random event that you have to know how to take advantage of yeah right? so you if that all of those things together that's an interesting outcome right like if you find a legendary apothecary and you understand the way brain brain works and you understand the cloning mechanics right like and 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 then if these situations come up and you recognize them 
then you get this huge out of band power boost. That's great gameplay to me, right? Like yeah. that's reward. That's rewarding world understanding. That's rewarding paying attention to your surroundings and, and systems mastery. Those are all the things we want to reward in Caves of Cut. We don't want to remove your ability to do that. We just want to make sure it's not, you know, every here run. is your rote grocery list of infinite power at the start of every. Right? Yeah, and I know that the the stilt kind of really toes the line right now, um, because yeah. like on one side it's like it's it's great to you want to offer the player some consistency because otherwise they're, they're just lost. It's just chaos. Um, but also, you know, like you do have to basically start every run where you go to the stilt and you talk to everyone. And I like to make notes and even like have extra, um, like I'll, I'll make extra notes on each tile to make sure that when I go to the stilt, I can like go to specific merchants without having to seek them out again. And I died again. Oh my God. <laughs> Golgotha is a cruel mistress. It is. Um, but like you know, so I, I, it's it's interesting. Like how how do you have to, how you have to play that balancing act of like what is, um, you know, I guess like random, um, kind of convergent mechanics versus consistency. And I do think that that's probably you know, part of what makes Cud so compelling is it is the convergence of those two things yeah yeah that's right i mean a lot of roguelikes are purely random and a lot of rpgs are purely static right like i think there's a lot of tension in those two elements it's hard to draw a line cud has drawn a line i don't know if it's optimal it works well enough right um i think that cud is such a disorienting world that if it was just purely random each time it would just just be un unmanageable right like i think i think the the weirdness of what surrounds the static skeleton of cud is part of what makes it work um that if you had as much sa static skeleton as cud has in a world that was a little less weird like it was a more traditional tolkien-esque fantasy game I don't think it would hold together as well, right? I think it would be a little too much static skeletoning. Um, but the 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 unfamiliarity of what surrounds the static skeleton lets us get away with a pretty meaty static skeleton of places um, and have the game still feel wild to explore. Yeah, I'm like, you know, if it really yeah, it really is like the culmination of like if it if it was um a kind of by the book sword and board then it certainly wouldn't be as compelling like i love the addition and the use of technology um it's it's one of my favorite parts of code like i love tinkering up stuff and modern stuff and oh my god let me do a pause here for a second all right we're we're back um with a very small time gap in between uh construction and <laughs> Yeah, hasn't, so, hasn't been too long. Nothing has happened in the inter, in the interim. No, uh, it hasn't been like literal weeks. I I actually do think it has been months pl plural, so that's pretty good. It probably has been. That's t how I tend to go. Is I'll slip I'll slip into a a work fugue and just have an infinite amount of work for a couple months and then come out of it for a little bit. Oh yeah, and, and so, it, like you've been you've been super busy since last week yeah yeah we, i mean we've had quite a lot going on since the like but the the, the whole since the last video the whole uh, kit fox announcement and trailer release has come out and the last time we were talking i was getting ready to really start on the push to get that release done and now we're on the the other side of it that release having happened and now everybody knows about our relationship with kit fox and has seen the new trailer new visual effects and all kinds of stuff. And so that that all went really well. I mean, the reaction was universally positive, except for just a smattering of trolls, I think. And um, everybody, I think the trailer turned out really great and the reaction to it was really great. So it's just, it's just been, it's been a really positive uh, announcement, I think. Awesome. Um, so like, I, I guess I wanted to ask, cause this is, is you know, super relevant right now is, um, do you want to, talk about uh how your relationship with kit fox came about and how that all came together we have we have been sort of personal friends with uh one of the studio heads tanya 
uh, for many years. She's she was very kind to us early uh, early on when we were just getting started, sort of in the professional game circle. To the extent we are in a professional game circle, um, and did some introductions, and and we we have hosted co-hosted some events at GDC over the years, um, and we have established a lot of trust with her. Um, and Kid Fox approached us and said, look, you're looking at publishers right now because you're heading into 1.0. They happen to know that we were doing that, and we've been doing over that over the last year or so, just preparing for release, knowing that we didn't need a publisher. Lots of games go to publishers much earlier than we do because publishers, one of the things, one of the many things that publishers do is that they provide funding for video games, often early funding. But we self-funded, which means... We we don't have a publisher mandate, but publishers also do a lot of other things other than other than funding. They do um, marketing production. They do negotiation with platforms um, like Xbox. They do negotiation with storefronts like Steam. Um, they do you know, they, they do all kinds of supporting work, streaming. Um, asset creation all, all all of that stuff that isn't really in our wheelhouse we know how to make a video game <laughs> we could do the marketing and the negotiation i think i think we're capable of it but i don't know that it's the best use of our time right like we have a very small team and there's still quite a lot of cud to go before 1.0 and i think that in addition to being able to do all that stuff there's a real advantage um to having a, a lot of games in a big stable when you're doing negotiation, right? And Kit Fox has proven very capable, um, certainly better than we would be at doing this kind of marketing and negotiation. They did a great job with Dwarf Fortress. Um, and they've got a stable of games that is much more attuned to the kind of vibe Cut is on than almost any other publisher, right? They have right. Dwarf Fortress, they have Six Ages, right? Um, they got several really niche, interesting narrative procedural games. And so for all of those reasons, um, I, we thought it made a lot of sense to sort of join that family. And, you know, so far right, we've done we've done one major trailer release with them. Uh, Kid Fox did did the trailer production by and large, right? Like we contributed the writing and a lot of the technician, but Kit, Kit, Kit Fox was deeply involved in, in its creation, and I think it's gone very well so far. So, you know, we have we have about a week under our belts of this relationship, but but I have I have no complaints. It's been really positive. Awesome. And uh, yeah, like I, I've also I, I don't know if this is uh, related to some of the Twitter stuff that's been going down down, but I, I, I see you guys are making a push for, for newsletters, which um, I mean, I've already jumped on, and I'm not sure like if y'all yeah. want me to put it in the description. But, we've um, had news. We've had newsletter lists since before the Steam release, but we've. I don't think we've ever sent an email to them. It, it, it <laughs> and seemed, so it seemed like an immediate pivot. It's like you guys are published. And it's like, hey, we have a newsletter. I'm like, I never knew. So, um, <laughs> yeah, well, Kate, Kate, Kate Fox does that stuff. That's the stuff that that they have a big enough team since they have so many games under them all dealing with publishing that they can much more efficiently handle communication in ways that we can't, right? We, we can write the feature Fridays, but we just don't have a lot of time to devote to to, to straight communication a lot of the time. Um, and so they do, they have a big skilled PR and marketing team um, that is directly connected to us, right? Like we're all in Slacks together. And so hopefully they can do a better job than we do at at communicating like human beings with with our, our players and no, newsletters one, one of those tools it makes it makes a lot of sense um so yeah like, like new new trailer uh which is by the way in incredible i i know that uh, you've been putting a lot of time and effort into uh, making cud a lot more animated um yeah yeah it's something i i've the this is like very specifically the little visual effects in the trailer or something that I've wanted to do for a very long time, but just always were down the priority list, right? It's always like, well, we need the trade UI to work because it isn't implemented or we need, you know, we need game pads to work. And this finally was a point where we're like, this is such an important announcement. Um, and 
what we're trying to do with this trailer is reach out beyond the people who are interested in sort of the poetic style trailer that we've done before. We want to do something that in 60 seconds or 90 seconds really, really shows people why you would want to play Caves of Cud. Um, like somebody who plays normal video games yeah. might, might be interested in. Um, without sacrificing the things that make Cud special, but really just show show people. And we thought one of the things that was important was that we we actually demonstrate in a way a video game might the things that are happening, which meant needing s not huge animations, right, but some kind of animation. And so fi finally, we got to do these visual effects. Um, I did. I we Jason wrote the trailer script. And from that script, we said, okay, here are all the moments that are going to be in the actual trailer. Here's all the visual effects that are, are going to be displayed. And we made a list of them, and I just started knocking them off, which is what you saw on, on my Twitter was me going through the list of, of visual effects from the trailer and knocking them off one by one until we had each of them implemented. Um, and But the nice part is it is as part of that build i built a nice little framework for these visual effects and so the goal is to have the full surface area of the game covered with these new visual effects by the by 1.0 um so over over the upcoming patches over the next year i'll be probably adding a few visual effects a week until everything has them and uh okay so that that are, that pretty much answers uh, my next question is i i guess i was i'm just curious like how how uh, deep into the, like animation rabbit hole are are you gonna go? Uh, like how many, how how big is your um your bucket list? I mean, the surface area is pretty big. Every missile weapon needs an animation. Most abilities need an animation. Really, all of them do. But we're gonna make a big prioritized list. Um, we haven't made that list, so I can't tell you what the number is yet. We we just sort of dove in without doing the project management preliminaries. Um, but that's sort of next on my list is to actually do an assay of the of the needful effects. Um, so we can say, look, we have however many hundred days before release and these effects, t we can do three of them a day. So <laughs> here, you know, this is this is this is what we're going to be able to do. And this is what we're going to have to cut for 1.0. Uh, but we don't we don't know exactly what that list looks like probably every player every player mutation that can't have effect will have an effect all the missile weapons will have an effect and then where we go outside of that like for unique animations for various monsters that will just depend on scope you know like if if a deep tier nine late game monster doesn't have a, is a text effect by the time you get there as a player you'll be able to parse what's happening right what's What's really most important is the player abilities in the early game monsters um, for players who are just starting CUD and are not yet parsing, you know, it's it's more traditional presentation of, of content. It definitely adds a lot more readability than I would have even, like, predicted. Like, you know, just seeing where rocks are coming from. And by the way, I'm not, for the viewer, I'm not running the, the animations beta. Uh, right now because we're I'm on an old build uh, the, the yeah. one that me pre animation pre animation in, in the world before cut animations um but yeah like just like seeing where the rock is coming from it, it just like it really does add a lot it's um like I really didn't see that coming like as as a feature list that never seemed to be um like from my perspective the priorities of uh cud not that you didn't want it to look nice. I, I know that that has always been part of the design philosophy of CUD, but it, it al also had like um, a structure of like in keeping with old uh, design, you know, like the original kind of rogue roots. So um, it came as, as kind of a surprise from my end. Yeah, I, I do think it, it's still, I don't think it, like you, like you say, it's surprisingly nice when you put it in place. It doesn't feel like it breaks the intent of the design, right? The, the intent of the design isn't to copy any existing system, right? Like the, the graphics, they evoke sort of the Commodore era. They evoke ASCII, but they aren't a, a copy of any of them, right? And so I think that that gives us more leeway than you would expect to get outside of the box on what it's doing, right? Like, so that these animations actually feel okay, because 
you know, it's not copying the 64 era, right? It's not copying actually the Commodore era. So you you also don't have the constraints of those eras. I guess the way oh. I see it is it's 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 the same thing to like the visual design of CUD as as the sound design. Like yeah. you you have like a a very modern era uh, you know, soundtrack and um, you know, sound design for for CUD. Um, and it's it's like um it's a very good kind of juxtaposition of like ancient looking game versus like very kind of modern qualities. Um, so yeah, I, I think that well, the animation fits quite well there. Yeah, like I mean, like Cud's World itself. Cud's World is a is a rough amalgam of all kinds of eras, right? It's, right. It's it suits it suits the game's content to be a little iconoclastic. Um, as long, you know, most of the, almost all of the effects adhere to some constraints though, right? Like I'm using pixels the size of the pixel art so that it does, it, it's not breaking the, the, that design language, right? Right. Um, it's, it's, it's still adhering to the basic design language of the game, but maybe in ways that a game wouldn't if it was actually made in 1970. Right? You'll you'll find purists to say, uh, that say, oh, but you you uh, have like rocks rotating, so they're no longer adhering to like the the, yeah, the, well, the and, pixel. And like the the there's a couple effects the neutron flux explosion doesn't strictly adhere to it be, because it's sort of uh, it's 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 tra it's a transgressive thing that's happening. Space time is kind of ripping apart, um, and and the missile trails don't strictly adhere to it um can but I, that was can a I, hold on let me let me just stop you there for one second all right we're 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 back from garage or garbage town <laughs> my god yeah i was gonna say like the the missile trails also don't strictly adhere to that but i thought that when i tried a a, a set of effects to see what would be the most readable those trails just work really nicely in game four whatever reason even though they don't like strictly adhere to the pixel art regime um they kind of read as crt burn or something which doesn't it doesn't feel bad it, like the readability i think is worth slightly transgressing out of the the strict pixel art boundaries yeah nothing has felt like out of place at least from my perspective like you know obviously this is subjective but like you know uh i personally have not seen any animation kind of stick out of place um so it's 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 just been like a wow this is just like a, a pure upgrade um and uh, to put it bluntly one that i can uh understand outside of some of the patch notes where it's like i i don't even know the context <laughs> for some of this stuff so it's just like yeah i i completely perceive this um yeah like like early on our our, our bugs were more understandable but we're really the game actually is relatively bug free for as complicated a game as it is. And so the bugs we're fixing now are way out in the corners of this of this sort of very folded uh, system and, and they're getting more and more arcane as we get deeper and deeper into the log. We've got, you know, we, we started with like 150 pages of bugs when we really started the final push and we're down to like 70 or 80 of them um and we're, we're hoping to get most of them actually closed up or at least triage is not important for 1.0 by the time we release and we're making pretty good progress but yeah that means we're it, we're, we're fixing weirder and weirder corner case interactions <laughs> as we get deeper into the bug list it's it's honestly uh like a highlight of my week is like let me try and understand the patch notes and if i do then then you know like oh nice i i, I kind of know how this game works sort of and then you throw me a curveball like you can only make friends with insects and in, like you know when you're not on the overworld or something like that. I mean, it's so complex that I mean, even none of the developers really have a a, a full grasp of it at this point. <laughs> we often will be like, "What is this bug even talking about?" You know, like none of us have ever get, not gotten into that situation at all. So, is it there ever been like a moment where it's like um, I don't know, like not you, but like uh, one of the devs or chaos has been told like you gotta fix this like very specific context and they're like i don't need uh, you're gonna have to break that down for me <laughs> oh every every week i mean it's, <laughs> it's 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 there's always some hilarious bug that we're surprised by or amazed by or don't understand at all um because i mean like with as many players as we have they explore 
you know, Vegas War corner case interactions that we just can't test. Um, and so it's it's often surprising and, and hilarious inside the bug hodels. All right. Well, um, that's our, 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 I'm just going to break it there because that's enough for the to complete the last episode. It's it's a little weird, but, um, you know, I'd rather just kind of stitch things together that way. Um, and I finally broke my dying streak because it seems like everything I was doing was leading to horrible events. So um, if you are enjoying this uh, talk with Brian uh, Bucklew, I, I encourage you to hit the like button and consider subscribing for more of this. And do uh, you have any closing thoughts? Uh, no, try out the beta. All the visual effects we're talking about are available on that branch or depend, like, if it's like 2027 when you're listening to this, they're probably available on the default if the world is still standing. Oh, fantastic. And you, do you have to be on the Patreon to get access to the, like, the fresh beta? No, the beta is just go on Steam or Itch or GOG and select the beta branch. Um, it'll be just called beta and those visual effects are available. Perfect. Awesome. Go, go check it out, like, right now. This'll, this'll be up next week, so it'll probably still be in beta. Yeah, definitely.